This morning, after uh, class, we are doing the uh, Six Patriarchs of uh, Sutra, winning uh, the Patriot. Uh, and during uh, the class, during the many topics that we usually talk about, uh, koans came up. Uh, and uh, Roshi explained you know, the reason why koans are given is to take us out of our uh, linear thinking. We are used to, in the uh, here of uh, Occident to think uh, of point A to B to C to D to Z. Z. And uh, what koans do is, is uh, precisely uh, help us get out of that linear thinking. And in a way, I could say it's instead of going from here to there, it'd be go f going from here to here. Same space, same time, but it's just your understanding shifts. And uh, uh, by the way, I was talking to Roshi yesterday, and, and you know, the Zen mind, the famous Zen mind, it, it's always talked about. Now there's a name for it, it's called quantic mind. <laughs> so I guess now uh, science is catching up to Zen. And uh, so during the class, and, and thinking about koans, uh, and the fact that they help us get out of our state of mind, which is many times uh, we are attached to our thinking, to our convictions, volition, precisely what the, what the sutra, the heart sutra mentions. So we're attached to our opinions and to our beliefs and, and it's just normal because you know we've grown in a certain environment that helped us define who we are and those experiences dictated what we should believe or not. So helping us, uh, koans helping us get out of, a, of our uh, state of mind that, that keeps us attached to, to uh, whatever we believe it is and uh, was speaking also in the class that uh, in my belief the only reason why we don't see our true nature or true mind, Zen mind, Buddha mind is because we believe that we are not capable and just precisely that same belief is the one stopping us from seeing it from from actually seeing outside of our own convictions and uh, so koans are just a way to, to help us. Meditation is the other the other thing that you know, it's that what kind of opens the, the, the path for, for us to start getting out of our uh, linear thinking. Why? Because you know, being uh, sitting quiet for a moment and like in the instruction that we're just giving, you would just sit there and let the thoughts just go. Just let them exist, let him come and let him go and as always been referred you are like the blue sky that allows the thoughts which are the clouds to pass by so the thoughts are just the clouds and you are the blue sky where those thoughts exist so you are the uh, source of those thoughts and then you sit down and meditate and you do not cling to those thoughts eventually you're gonna come to a point in which they just become like mere flashes you might uh, uh, if you let them just exist they'll just take you on a, on a train of thought that's gonna take you from here to the Himalayas and back but then if you just let them exist they're gonna come to a point where your mind just gets tired thinking and, and it just become like flashes your thoughts become flashes and because they exist, exist but you're not attached to them you're not, not clinging to them so that's another way that we have of, 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 of you know beginning to see or getting out of our linear thinking so during the uh, the class uh, I, I 
told this experience that I had, which I've told many times, uh, that was uh, when I first started coming to this temple many years ago, well, not many, but a few years ago, uh, I came and it, and, and it was early, and Mudita, or Brother Mudita, was here, and then Roshi was there, so it was only the three of us. And Mudita came, and he had a book with koans. And this book, apparently, I don't even remember the name, and I've forgotten to ask Roshi which book it was, but Mudita came, and he was so happy, because he brought this book, and the book had the answer to all the koans that exist. <laughs> So he's telling Rosh, okay, Rosh, so here's the, here's the book with all the answers, so I don't need to practice koans, and Rosh is like, it doesn't do any good. So Mudita's like, but this book was so hard to get, it's like out of print, and, and you know, it's just like, this is a, a jewel in itself. And Rosh is like, well, what good does it do? And Mudita's like, but you don't understand, this is a very unique book. <laughs> So they kept going back and forth, and I'm just sitting there in the back and uh, just watching the interaction between them. And then Modita goes on, something like, okay, so then Roshi, tell me, what is the sound of one hand clapping? And then Roshi just standing there, and he has his hand in the back, just like a, I get like a true Zen master, <laughs> and he goes like this. And I'm just sitting there, and there, talking and laughing and I'm just sitting in the back just watching the interaction and with the moment Roshi does this I even in my mind I see his hand moving and I can almost hear this his sleeve cutting through the air and at that moment something happened and it was like Someone hit me. My, the best description that I have for it is like someone hit me in the back of the head with a sledgehammer. And when he said, that's Mu, and, and to me it was just like, I couldn't even understand. I just, when I saw the movement of his hand, I just understood. And this goes back to the class. A koan, it's designed to get you out of your linear thinking, but the answer does not lie. It could, but in, my, in it's what we were talking about this morning, you, the answer in the koan is within the same words, then it would be more like a riddle. Because if you look into the words, it's more like a riddle, more than a koan, and a koan is precisely to get you out of your thinking. So. I guess the answer to Kwan is something that, that uh, goes beyond words, and that's precisely the point of it, going beyond words. So when I was going through this thing, and, and then Mudita and Roger are still there joking and talking, and I'm here in the back sitting and, and trying to understand what's going on, and I'm like in a dazzle, and, and I just can't even think. I just, there, not trying to understand, but just seeing what was in, going inside of me. And uh, so I guess if that's, that's a way of solving a koan that you didn't ever ask for. <laughs> and and uh, it took me actually several weeks to even start grasping what had happened. I, I couldn't even put words in it because it's not something that I could put in words. And that's precisely the, the uh, 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 Zen, that's what it is. It's, it's experiential, uh, uh, experimenting, uh, experiencing, experiencing what you're sitting. When you're sitting, what it's about experiencing more than words, more than reading a book, when they're trying to understand our minds. It's about seeing our true nature, seeing this mind that that understands and in the class we were seeing that uh uh winning and six the sixth patriarch you know he's saying that that uh only people that can see, see their true mind their true nature are capable of getting enlightenment so being able to see our true nature 
will give us understanding. I mean, this experience that I had, it was an experience that, you know, this is something that, like I say, it took weeks for me to understand. Now, when I was kind of able to have some understanding of it, I was, okay, what good does it do? I mean, it was a great experience if I can put it, put some words to it, but what does it do? How's it gonna help me actually being a better person or, or not being a better person, just improving my quality of life? And then we go back to Zen being an experiential thing that is gonna help you understand yourself, which is all you really need to understand. You don't really need to try to, in my opinion, very personal, sutras are great, books are great, but if all this practice doesn't help you be just a little bit more happy or happier and, and just being more relaxed and, and giving yourself space, you know, for you to accept who you are and being exactly the way you are. And then you'll see that, that uh, your struggles in life start kind of fade or fade, you know, they fade away because you're not put in resistance, which is uh, uh, letting go. It's, it's uh, uh, the resistance that we have to letting go things produces anxiety. So our anxiety comes from that resistance of not allowing ourselves to let go. Why? Because we're convinced that whatever our belief or thought is, we have a reason and we are right. So there's no, no uh, uh, better way of, of, uh, of letting go than just stop putting that resistance. You know, uh, many times uh, when you have a resistance to let go of something, it could be mostly it's personal stuff, you know, the personal things that happen. And we believe that we have reason people that do us wrong or whatever they do to us and, and we have a reason not to forgive them. But we choose not to forgive them because we want to hold to that. The moment we forgive, we have nothing to hold against them and we don't have control over them. So letting go might be one of the hardest things that we, any human being can do. It's just, it's just especially when something has done, uh, uh, you know, purpose or you know could be physical could be anything that might have done to you in purpose it's it's hard it's hard but uh, I think just in the the fact of letting go of forgiving is the lesson in itself and a few days ago I was uh, just going through Facebook uh, and someone had a, a one of those memes you know it says I didn't know how strong is this. I don't remember the exact words, but it was something in in the in the lines of, I didn't know how strong I was until I forget someone who didn't ask for forgiveness and gave uh, uh, a poly or, or forgiving someone who never apologized. So in other words, we want to hear that person that did us wrong to, to apologize and understand and accept that they did us wrong. And that's, 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 it might never happen. So as long as you don't let it go, you don't forget that, what's gonna happen? The other person is probably watching Netflix and movie <laughs> and they're doing okay and they, here you are. And, and how long is that going to take in your life? How, how many <clears throat> things is that not letting go of robbing you off in your life? All the moments that you're missing and are lost already, and you're going to lose because you don't want to let go. So that's, that's, uh, that's, that's what I, I, I understood when, I, when the moment came to really face, okay, what, what am I going to do with this teaching that, that I just 
this wonderful teaching that I, I didn't ask for and it was given to me. So first of all, you feel uh, grateful because something you didn't ask for and is given to you. And, and, and then you start, when you start seeing things like that and, and you pay attention to all the things that are given to you without even asking, being alive, being healthy, you know, having a job, having a house. And when you start really being grateful for, for, from the bottom of your heart, and just the fact that just waking up and, and I woke up, that's enough reason to be, to be uh, uh, happy and grateful. So that's one of the, the outcomes of, of letting go. It's just that you're going to just, just be able to get up in the morning and, and not having to, a reason to be upset or mad or, you know, at anything or anybody. That's, that's pretty much, I guess, the beginning of, and I would say just a little enlightenment that we're getting. And, and many times, speaking of enlightenment, I guess we all expect to get a big enlightenment and, and get, you know, thunder and lightning and the trumpets in the sky are gonna, but I think we just, those little tastes of, 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 of happiness are pretty much enlightenment. That those moments when you sit to meditate and you can just feel happy that you're sitting, that you had 10 minutes or whatever time you sit to meditate, just being happy because you have those 10 minutes that, to, to sit and meditate. And like uh, Dogen said, uh, meditation and enlightenment are one and the same. And it's funny because this morning while reading the Patriarch, uh, the Sixth Patriarch uh, Sutra, he says exactly the same thing. Meditation and enlightenment are one. So any minute that we do a meditation and we can just, you know, be calm, I, I guess it's, it's a, sort of put a little taste, a little taste of, of, of what enlightenment must be like. But again, I think we have, through so much of, of, of Buddhism, I guess, in the, in the West, that we have so many ideas that, are, that have been built around our idea of what Buddhism or what Zen or what enlightenment is. But if we go beyond all, all the ideas, all the concepts, and we can just, you know, be able to sit, just have a cup of water, and, and just taste it. And if you're thirsty, believe me, a cup of water is going to be the most wonderful thing in the world. It's the same thing with everything. If we're just able to be appreciative of, of all the things that we have, of all the uh, uh, I guess uh, blessings, blessings that, that, that we have and just accept them. Just accept those blessings, even if you're not really in the mood to accept anything, just give it a thought. Give it a thought and, and again, we go back, letting go. Letting go is just stop putting off resistance to what it is. And what it is is I guess it's just us, but not really being caught in our own tragedies and stories. So we just accept that 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 moment, and it doesn't have to be moment after moment after moment because that's another. Then we get caught in, in, in the same thing. Now we want to be happy and we're going to go after those moments and then we start suffering, we start chasing those moments again. But again, just being able to get just that one little moment of being uh, uh, grateful for all we have, I think 
just that is just one step towards finding our own true nature.